Greetings. My name is Guy Dauncey, and you're watching Change the World. This is the show where we take some of the big issues that cause us headaches in the world, from homelessness to the economy to a climate crisis and how do we protect nature and the forests, and we look for big, bold solutions. So my guest today is Jim Spinelli, Hi, who has the, the privilege, I should say, of being the executive director of the Nanaimo Affordable Housing Society for 20 years. Correct. And before that, you were working in Edmonton's inner city for 10 years before that. So you've got, you've got some, um, let's say, um, chips off the old block, some, some bruises, some uh, experiences, <laughs> some learnings. <laughs> Absolutely. So wel <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank and you. Tell us about your work in the Affordable Housing Society, just to get started. How big a problem is the, is the housing crisis in Nanaimo? Huge. Huge. Okay. Huge. That's How a simple, huge? simple answer. Um, who's it affected? It depends which sector of the, which part of the housing sector you want to talk about. Um, you know, from my understanding, we still have a f reasonably affordable uh, single-family homes. Uh, the market is hot, but it hasn't taken off. I have some realtors on my board of directors yeah. that have talked about that. Uh, where we uh, certainly there is a huge gap in the need for rental housing. Yeah. Uh, it is starting to be addressed a bit by the private sector, but for all intents and purposes, between 1980 and this year, or last year, um, there has been no new rental housing built. Well, the government's kind of signed off, didn't they? The federal government and provincial government said, well, sort yourselves out. That's right. They did. And the same with social housing to a degree. Yeah. Uh, and we don't, people that are at what we call core need, who have very, very low and limited yeah. in fixed income, the problem is immense. Right now, uh, estimates are, well, there was a study done in 2011 that uh, said that there were about 4,000 households in, in Nanaimo alone in deep core need that so, weren't being housed. So tell our viewers what deep core need means. We, for instance, on most of my projects, we house people that are, are reliant on the social assistance system yeah. uh, for the last 10 years, they've gotten $375 a month to cover their shelter. 375 So um, Okay, and, and the, the, the lowest rent for a single room basement suite is what, 700 Currently, well, you can still find places in Nanaimo for around six. Six, okay. <laughs> so that's, bump, that's a different. With, with two friends, now you're down to 200 so, but. Potentially, but you know, if you do live with someone, the, uh, the welfare system Reduces your shelter allowance. Reduces it. That's nice. Just, very kind right, of them. That's very yes, kind yeah. of them. Absolutely. Um, so those four thousand people, are they currently renting summer but spending fifty percent of their income and stuff on rent? Is that what's happening? Some are doing that. Some are homeless. Some are couch surfing. Yeah. Some are staying with family. I mean, people do all kinds of things. Living rough, living in tents in our yeah. parks. Uh, in this weather. I mean, in what this weather. people will right. you'll be seeing this program later. But right now it is zero out there. There's snow everywhere. Absolutely. And that's not. Well, it's never good to be living it's in the good. parks no, or living rough. No, we have a couple people just in the last week have been living outside of my building where my office is, yeah. just sleeping on the ground. And how many churches? How many churches and similar groups like Salvation Armies are providing emergency shelters? There's actually just two, there are three shelters in Nanaimo. There's the Salvation Army shelter downtown. There's the uh, overflow shelter. What started out as an overflow shelter and now is yeah. a wet weather shelter that the Unitarian Church is running. Yeah. But I think they have. 30 or 40 beds, yeah. uh, and then there's a, the Samaritan House, which is the women's wow. shelter. So let's just go straight. This first image I've got here of a, you know, a young homeless person, if you can bring the image up. Yeah. Just with the homeless people who you know in Nanaimo, how are they, how are they coping at the moment? Many not coping very well. They're cold and they're wet because we've had a very, very wet fall, yeah. as you can imagine. Uh, so they're sleeping where they can. Uh, I'm not, you know, we're not involved as uh, Nanaimo Affordable Housing in the shelter system, yeah, sure. so I can't speak to the yeah. operations and how full they are yeah. and how they're operating in Nanaimo. Uh, we're, we're really the permanent yeah. housing side as yes. opposed to the temporary we'll, housing side. We'll come side. to that set yeah. of solutions, but this is a reality yeah. that those of us who are happy enough to live in comfortable houses, Absolutely. you know, need to acknowledge, right? Yeah. And this, this next slide here um, is basically the reality of couch surfing. How, what do you know about the couch surfing scene with people struggling and living in basements? And, we and, know, you know people are, and certainly I get 
five or six calls a day from people who are looking for housing, most of whom I say the best we can do is get you onto a waiting list. Yeah. And so I can talk about time. those waiting lists. I mean, but your, your whole career is based on creating permanent solutions. That's right. And every day you're saying, no, I can't help you. That's right. That's right, because we only have so many units and they don't turn over very often. Uh, yeah. When we're housing people on fixed income, my housing for singles, we have 20, 64 units for singles in yeah. Nanaimo. Every one of the, my tenants is has a permanent disability, gets $375 a month. Yeah. We're able to house them at that amount because yeah. we have a government subsidy in order to help us yeah. to do that. But the building where my offices, which is 20 years old, yeah. I have a third of the tenants that have been living there for the full 20 years that we've been open. Wow. And we turn over units about once every seven or eight years. Yeah, people want to, once you get a home, you want to stay, you stay there. Of course, that you can afford, you'll yeah. stay. So staying with the homelessness issue, this next slide shows the city of Medicine Hat in Alberta adopted this program called Housing First, right? And they have solved the homelessness problem. What does Housing First mean? <clears throat> housing First is saying that regardless of what issues a person might be having, uh, that getting them into housing is the first priority. So instead of saying first you get dry or first you get off drunks That's and right. first That's you right. become a lovely clean middle class person and then we'll give you a home, right? That's right. <laughs> exactly. That, that's basically the theory of Housing First. Uh, one of the problems with Housing First is that it's not permanent housing all the time. Okay. It can be non-permanent housing right. that they're putting people in or temporary yeah. s living situations. Uh, I know that the federal government did a study, uh, and not being critical, uh, they provided a service for some people where they helped uh, a limited number of people yeah. across the country. But I remember meeting some of the people that were in Vancouver that were in the federal program, and they were living in apartments in Kitsilano and Vancouver had, that were $1,200 a month. Well, yeah. once the federal government wasn't there anymore, yeah. they weren't going to be living there because no. they would never be able to afford it. But I'm told that Medicine Hat is about 60,000 population, so kind of similar to, to Nanaimo. A little smaller, but yes. Has Nanaimo Council or Regional District discussed adopting a housing first approach? I don't, you know, that's tricky. I can't, I can't answer what okay. the city has talked about. Okay. You know, I mean, the city, uh, back in 2008, signed yes. a memorandum of understanding with the province and got 160 units of housing uh, yeah. committed from the provincial government. Right. But it took several years to roll that out. So one of our projects, which opened in April of this year, yeah. uh, was one of those projects. Right. So it took eight years before all of the units were built. Wow because yeah. uh, various reasons. So let me, I've got two images of, of well, this is one of your projects here, right? I'm so not coming up, there we go. Um, right, that's my project on Bowen Road. Yeah, how long has that been built and how many that, people live there? That opened in 2008. It's got 21 lovely, one bedroom units. It, it looks great. It's an interesting design because it looks more townhouse, but yeah. they're one bedroom apartments up and down. Okay. Uh, so the, the units upstairs enter from the back and you go up a flight of stairs okay. to your yeah. unit and then yeah. the level entry for the units in the front. Yeah. Uh, again, that complex, everyone in that complex is on a fixed income, and we yeah. turn over units there about once every three or four years, a right. little more often than my other ones, yeah. uh, and we have a waiting list of about 600 people. So let me go. How many people live in this <laughs> 20. little 20, and you've got a waiting list of 600? 600. That's in general, right? That's for, basically, that is the only complex for s there are other complexes for singles, the ones that were built for okay. street homeless. Right. We have some that we're pr principally focused on housing people so, with a psychiatric disability. So 20 into 600 is 30. This is you need 30 more projects like this oh, yeah, and, to mop up. But that. there's actually 4,000 people in Nanaimo that get $375 a month. So yeah. we could actually build 100 more of those buildings. Well, let me this, this next project here. Um, what's this one? Uh, I have to remember which one it is. Sorry, I'm looking oh. at the wrong. All right, that's uh, Wallace, uh, our project on Wallace. We, we opened that in 2005. Principally yeah. in that complex, again, everyone is on a, has a permanent disability, but we also contract between this project and one other of ours f with the health region with mental health and addiction services. Okay. Um, and we, so that's our principal target group, and we actually yeah. have those, that building has staff Monday to Friday 
right. uh, nine to five. Yeah. And we're on call. Of course, as landlords, you're on call 24 hours a yeah. day. Uh, but we're also on call for if someone's having a personal crisis, they can right. call and talk to one of the staff. Uh, at and any you've got time. four other projects as well, right? I have four other projects, but they're very different. I have a family housing complex, yeah. a small, uh, that's rent geared to income. Yeah. Uh, so we actually income test on that project and people pay 30% right. of their income, okay. whatever that might be. Yeah. Uh, we have now a seniors complex with uh, 82 units yeah. of seniors housing, which was subsidized originally, but is now off of subsidy, so yeah. we charge $500 on the door. Does that have a waiting list as well for seniors? There is a waiting list, but it's not as high because okay. there's a number of other options for okay. seniors. There's about 10 seniors housing complexes okay. in Nanaimo, so yeah. we're not the only seniors yeah. housing provider. And that's where we're actually just have gotten approved to build another 70 units of seniors right. housing at now, that site. So the, the new, I know that the, between the, that with the housing crisis being suddenly in the headlines, um, the Liberal government in BC and federally have, are finally putting some money together. So yes. will there be some coming to Nanaimo for uh, new in projects? In the most recent provincial call, four projects were approved in Nanaimo, 132 units. Uh, very different ones. There's a group that houses people straight, uh, strictly with psychiatric disability yeah. that are going to, they have a complex right now of four units, expanding it to 22. It's a tear down and rebuild, so, uh, but on, on a site. Yeah. Um, there's a housing project that is being, was proposed by uh, the Nanaimo Association for Community Living or yeah. building a mixed, uh, both people with developmental disabilities and families okay. uh, yeah. that was actually ready to go or had a development permit, but yeah. Provence is putting some money into that. Uh, there's another seniors housing group, Mount Benson Seniors, that yeah. got uh, approved to build 50 more yeah. units of seniors housing. So together, that you said it's 140 units. 132. 132. Out of 4,000. Well, that's what that's what government put up this year. Okay. Right? So that was out of the 500 million. There were yeah. there were projects funded all around the province. So the yeah. the call for proposals went out to the entire province. Yeah. One of the differences this time is that there's no subsidies. So. They're pushing the nonprofit sector now. Yeah. We have to look at a mixed market development. So we'll have some units that'll be just below market. Right. Uh, they will still do some income testing around yeah. that because we want to make sure there's people that need the yeah. affordability. Uh, and then we, by doing that, we end up subsidizing our own units. So yes. we're hoping that maybe we can have 25% of the units in our new build yeah. that will actually be at 500 a month, which is what we charge right. our seniors. But it's, it's a very complex market. Even our seniors housing at $500 a month, we know that 25% of the tenants that we currently house are paying yeah. more than 50% of their income for yeah. rent. I see it as a four <laughs> level crisis because like, I lived in Victoria 25 years. And uh, I mean, I know here in the Nanaimo there is still stuff on the market for say 250,000. Yeah. In Victoria, like the bottom end price is like 500,000 now, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. And so a while ago, say 20, 30 years ago, if you've if you're got a job with a sort of middling-ish income, you can make the jump from renting to buying and, and scrape together the down payment and cover the mortgage payment. Now it's just like the millennials are saying, like, it it's, it's can't be done. You know, I have a stepson that's 30 living in Vancouver and with his, par yeah. with his partner, but they know that they're probably never going to be able to so, buy a so house. So you've got the people struggling to, to be able to live in a house. <clears throat> that's pushing up. They're still renting, so rental prices get pushed up. So the people at the bottom end of the rental market, they're feeling squeezed. Some of them end up couch surfing or Absolutely. people aged 30, 40 in their parents' basements or whatever, reluctantly still living with the parents. And then among those, the more challenged end up on the streets, right? That's right. So you're, you also have a role... Um, as director of the BC Nonprofit Housing Association. So does that link all the different, tell me, tell me about it. It does. Uh, it's basically, it's been, the organization's been in existence, I think we're having the 25th anniversary next year, uh, was started by some housing providers who felt that they needed to have a better voice yeah. uh, the to the provincial government and came, right? came together. Yeah. And it's hard for individual groups to advocate because decisions often get made politically, yes. as you know, yes. uh, when there's uh, government dollars involved yeah. in programs. Um, and when I first started, uh, and they started by doing training programs and advocacy, basically, yeah, okay. is where they started. Yeah. 
Um, and I, when I first started, I didn't know much about housing 20 years ago. Uh, I had good community skills, good people skills, but didn't yeah. really know much about housing. Did so you, I took- Tell you a secret, we all learn on the job. <laughs> I, I <laughs> took every training course that BC Nonprofit Housing Association yeah. offered and was so impressed that I decided to put my name forward to stand for the board of directors Fantastic. and been reelected six times wow. now. So, uh, but the, uh, there are, 700, something like that, nonprofit organizations around the province That's of BC a, that run housing. That's impressive. 40,000 units of social housing. Now, does it include housing cooperatives, whether managed no, uh, by the people? No, cooperatives, there's another 14,000 uh, units okay. in housing cooperatives. Right. It's a separate system. There's a BC co op housing federation that actually supports them. The they also address the problem yeah. as well of affordability, yeah. absolutely. And in fact, the two organizations as of last year now are co housed. We okay. share an office and share right. some uh, services sense. and they can uh, lobby together and economies then, uh, of scale. That's together, right. Right. So from the provincial perspective, what is needed? You know, we would like to, if you look at it from a provincial perspective, we would like to see the government put the amount of money that they announce this year every year yeah. and more. I mean, it, we, my, the reality my, is you need that. Uh, yeah. And nationally, they say that the push to get the federal government, they should have been building 10,000 units of housing a year. That's how far behind, because they well, stopped being in housing in 1995. Well, in the, the, the Canadian uh, Center for Policy Alternatives in Vancouver, their analysis showed greater Metro Vancouver alone needed 10,000 a year. Yeah. So I just did a, you know, in my studies, it seems like for the province, you need between 10 and 20,000 a year. Yeah, absolutely, easily, you know, but Will there ever be the political will to get us well, there? I, I don't know. And we certainly, you know, the people that are at the bottom, who we house, are, are desperate. So let me put something to you. Back in the night, late 1950s and early 60s in Saskatchewan, they had a health care seen as a crisis by Tommy Douglas and people, with people just couldn't afford health care, right? Yeah. So Tommy Douglas put together Medicare for Saskatchewan, and he rolled it out, I think, in 1962, and the doctors went on strike, and young doctors came, and, and it became the rule, and it became the whole of Canada. So now we accept a full Canadian program for healthcare. Yes, we do. I want to put the pitch that we need the same level of audace, audacious big thinking for Canada as a whole. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we've all, we all have hopes yeah. uh, that the federal, you know, the federal government was going to announce their housing strategy just a few weeks ago, but they actually came out with just a report I and they saw pushed that. it off. announced it in the spring, yes. Uh, so, you know, we're all anxious to see what the new federal government so, is going to do and what right. kind of commitment they're going so to make. So let's assume they, there's a, a lot of money needed to build between, that's for BC, just 10 to 20,000. How about we have, or well, Vancouver's already doing a tax on empty homes, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense, okay? How about a surcharge on the super wealthy homes that are over, over two million, you know, so a bit higher um, property transfer tax? Sure. How about yeah. a super tax on all the homes bought through illegal offshore money when there's tax haven money? I think they're all, we know Vancouver's they're, full they're of all things that lead yeah. to the housing crisis that yes. we're facing in our province. And Seattle has a municipal levy um, for affordable housing, which they have for 20, 30 years, and they've built mm -hmm. 12,000 units. So it's, it's a little slice, you know, 12 bucks right. a year on the municipal taxes. It all helps, right? Absolutely. Uh, anything that, that, that they can come up with to do, uh, but we have to deal with the, you know, the issues of economic disparity in our country. I think yeah. that's one of the huge ones that certainly catches people in the housing. And because we have a, a housing market that is growing and, and also the cost is increasing at such yeah. a rapid rate, Again, the people that are at the very bottom economically are in yeah. big trouble. So one thing struck me when I was sort of preparing for this and doing a lot of thinking is that two-thirds of Canadians, have, they either own property or they have parents who own property. When the parents die, they will inherit. Yes. And so they're able to, with the inheritance, they can stay in the property and everything. One-third of Canadians don't own property and they don't have parents who own property. So they will, unless they win the lottery, or get a really genius new business thing, <laughs> Absolutely. they're never going to inherit. So the gap between the property owning and the non-property owning with the rise in property prices is getting wider and wider. So I look at that and say, we're looking to have a Canada with like two classes of people, one constantly renting, paying money to the property owners in their monthly rent check, 
Yeah. And the other is owning property and receiving that money. So the inequality gap grows bigger and bigger. This, this is something got danger signs. I, it's been going on for a long time, though. Yeah. I, I'd say we're already at a danger point. Yeah, that's right. So what does it take? <clears throat> do, you, do you think we've got enough threshold that when we come to the provincial election in May, that this crisis is, is a big enough to be top of the agenda, maybe along with the climate crisis? And I think that you know housing affordability clearly is on every agenda right now, every political agenda. What we don't see on the agenda is dealing with the people at the, again, when I talk about the bottom of the economic scale. Right. I mean, a good example, here we have a $500 million the province just put into new projects, but there's no ongoing subsidies to house the people that are at yeah. the bottom level of the economic scale. We need to have that impact as well. I mean, it's fine yes. to, that we are looking for housing affordability across right. the spectrum, but we can't forget about the people at the bottom. For sure. And I don't hear government talking about them. Now, we know from our history that when, you know, before labor unions existed, people did their 100 hour, 120 hour working weeks and their kids worked down the coal mines and stuff like that. And then people finally organized and made enough noise to get attention. Do you think that we need some way for people who are struggling to make more noise and sort of be organized together? Because the nonprofits are run by their staff. The people themselves, can well, they be empowered to make a noise and, and have their, vo their needs heard? Historically, people that are at uh, the bottom of the economic ladder are also quite disenfranchised and yeah. are the least... They vote less. Vote less, that's right. They're le and, and don't participate. Uh, some because they have some issues uh, yeah. that don't allow them well, to participate. Well, they're too busy surviving to well, absolutely. Think about that's, it. that's another piece, too. Just right? finding the food to put on the table. Exactly. But it's, I would wager it's also true. I haven't, I, that's probably, if you took all the MPs and all the MLAs, they're probably, all of them, in the property owning 70%. Yeah. And so the, the renting 30%, including the couch surfing, the homeless, the people with disabilities and needs, are they getting their voices heard in the legislature and in parliament? I mean, I think that you have organizations like BC Nonprofit Housing, Nanaimo Affordable Housing. We're constantly talking to government about those things, yeah. but you know, we haven't yet been successful. I mean, we talk about it at our board table, and you know, yeah. when provincial government announced the 500, uh, 500 million, we said, "Yay for the 500 million!" Yeah. But wait a minute. What are you going to do for the people that are yeah. at the bottom? Because, I mean, this is, this is, you might find it quirky, but I, when I was aware of the housing crisis on Salt Spring Island, where the people running the stores live in winter accommodation, which is empty because of holidaymakers, and they're thrown out living in the woods in the summer. But the economy can't operate without them. That's right. So if they were to organize and say, look, here's the solutions we need, six months come back to us. Six months, no progress. We're going to go on strike midsummer for an hour every lunchtime. Next week, two hours. Next week, three hours. I know what will happen because it happened to Tofino already. The businesses are calling up the politicians and saying, do something. Absolutely. My workers need a place to live. Yeah, and it's true even of more, um, you know, we've heard from municipalities uh, around the province, housing firemen, yeah. RCMP, professionals come in and can't afford at it's the wrong. salaries that they're getting to it's crazy. buy a house yeah. or even find accommodation, rental accommodation yeah. for their families. So it, it's, say, it's been a huge crisis. It's been building, I say, since 1980 yeah. when they took out the, the MERB funding to, yeah. that encouraged the private sector but to build rental housing. But if we could somehow housing. unite the groups, that the millennials and your engineer who want to buy a house and can't, the people who are struggling to pay rent, the people who are fed up with couch surfing and the homeless themselves, this is one problem cascading down, which we need to sort of get in people. Any, any politicians watching this, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> We're speaking to you about not to ignore the 30% because there's a lot of hardship and pain going on. Oh, it is. And it, but it, it also is a very, very complex issue because, yeah. you know, we talk now density, right? Density yes. is what you need to bring your housing costs down, yeah. but you also have people that fight against density. Yeah. Uh, anytime you're put a, trying to put a multifamily uh, yeah. complex into a single-family home neighborhood, 
you get opposition. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Let me tell you, I've got two more images I want to show you. First one simply, this is actually, it's a, it's a regular project down in Washington State, but this is, these easily could be affordable units, right? They're small. Yeah. What's happening here is that it's also building relationship and community. Absolutely. So I hear from younger people, they don't just want a house, they want to live in a sense of community. And this next slide shows a tiny home village. People are saying to me, why can't we get land and develop a tiny home village like this so that it actually, you know, it looks like this. And I'm single, I, I'd love to live in a tiny home. What does it take as a one additional solution to make this kind of thing happen? Uh, again, land, uh, huge, yeah. huge problem, finding land to build it uh, that's accessible to services. I mean, try to find land in downtown Nanaimo right now. You know, we we well, wouldn't be downtown. This has to be greater. Yeah, it'd be than, outside. But then, yeah, you know, as soon as you move out of the core, then you have transportation, transportation issues. issues. Yeah. That's right. You know, so we we've looked at some properties and said, you know, for the population that we house, if there's not public transit, if it's yeah, not easy. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. You know, so these people, people get bicycles there. and safe bike roads, well, as we right. were talking about this earlier on the but show. But we're talking about some major change here. And we're talking society, big, we bold should, yeah. solutions. Absolutely. Yeah. One of my, if I can, if I have a minute, yeah. uh, a couple, two years ago at the BC Nonprofit Conference, uh, we have an annual conference every year. Yes. In fact, this year, 1,100 people were at our housing conference. So it's a, Wow, that's a big turnout, 1,100. a big turnout, absolutely. Um, but there was a speaker from California, and he has developed a system that he can build houses using 3D printer technology extruding concrete instead of Amazing. Uh, plastic. Yeah. yeah. I can actually build a house. But unfortunately, the technology isn't there yet. Well, I saw in China to do it, but it's a brilliant idea. Build a house right? in a week in China with this kind of system. But with these tiny homes, people are, <laughs> this is, if you like, a trailer park you know, 2.0. But there's a more conscious desire for, for quality of, of and, and for also control of the land. So the idea of a community land trust, which we haven't had time to bring up, where the land is off the market forever, I think is an important part of the future. I think so too. Yeah, I think and, and, going that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even, but the city of Nanaimo, to their uh, credit, you know, I, of my six complexes, four are situated yeah. on land that has been leased from the city for 60 years. Yeah. So the city yeah. has been making land available yeah. to the nonprofits for a long time yeah. to uh, when the opportunity's there. Not always, yeah. but they well, look, have Jim, done it. You, you do this as your normal day job. You take it for granted, right? <laughs> there are people out there who really appreciate what you're doing. Oh, so you. look. Thanks very much. Thank you for the work you're putting in. I appreciate that. Thank you. This has, I'm Guy Dornsey. This has been our show, Change the World. Um, I personally also put together a book called Journey to the Future that explores all of these ideas in the shape of a fictional novel. So you can buy this in the bookshops to get a vision of when we put all these big, bold solutions together, we can change the world. Thank you for being with us and join us next week. Goodbye.